And then I'll probably, whoever's doing an exam, I'll just let you choose what you want to talk about, um, which lecture topics, and, <laughs> and then I'll ask an extremely detailed question. Um, there aren't many. more for last time, but I, I knew I wouldn't get through them all, so I thought maybe I'd, I'd step with them throughout this and any future lectures I give. Um, but it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about today. Um, so the, the topic of today's lecture is the relationship between uh, art and beauty and philosophy generally. Um, so in the previous lectures, I've gone through some central areas of philosophical aesthetics, I'm sure there have been many errors of admission, but at least uh, uh, hopefully some idea of the subject area has developed. Um, and I probably haven't tied up lots of the questions which I asked earlier on, like why do we study art and beauty together? I hope it was at least implicit in what I said that that depends on the degree to which we're willing to go along with someone like Monroe Beardsley, who thinks that uh, art is uh, uh, essentially related to beauty. Um, if we're not, then, then it doesn't make sense to study these together. Although you might add to that that historically it would be pretty hard to deny that art has been uh, uh, closely related to uh, beauty, even if it's not essentially so. So perhaps it doesn't matter so much uh, when we're considering philosophical aesthetics, uh, 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 when we're considering philosophically uh, uh, historic attitudes to art and instances of it, um, whether the aesthetic theory can be extended to the modern avant-garde. Uh, or to its exclusion, indeed. Um, so all of that was treating the subject matter of aesthetics, art and beauty, as uh, an area of philosophical inquiry. Um, and the question I want to consider in this lecture is whether the same subject matter, art and beauty, are of philosophical import over and above being an area of philosophical inquiry. So, as you're aware, you can inquire philosophically into all sorts of areas. There's, there's you know, philosophy of mind and philosophy of science, philosophy of religion, philosophy of language. Um, you could even inquire philosophically into something like football, and people have, if it's something that interests you, or into stamp collecting, uh, if that's something that interests you. Um, so, for pretty much any area that interests us, we can prefix the locution philosophy of and form a, a, a sub-area of philosophy which is likely to have instances of some of the perennial broad philosophical questions and perhaps some puzzles of its own. Um, however, it might be that some of these areas are of independent philosophical importance uh, and perhaps not merely as an area to be studied philosophically, but as things which might contribute to uh, our understanding of philosophy. For instance, uh, Stephen Priest very frequently denies that history can contribute to our understanding of philosophy. 
obviously the only reason for making such a denial is that some people act as if this were not the case, uh, treat history as having uh, historical facts, as having philosophical import. Um, so you might think that uh, art in particular is something which could have philosophical import of its own in a way that something like football or stamp collecting that we can study philosophically doesn't. And indeed, some people have thought historically that the arts might even constitute a rival to philosophy. Uh, they might be doing something like enough to philosophy that, that we might have to choose between them, or, or we might be impoverished uh, by looking at one without the other. Um, so this is obviously a very, it's an enormous question, uh, and I'll only be able to give it quite a, 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 a basic and, and crude overview uh, today, but hopefully I'll touch on some interesting points related to it. Um, one difficulty of this question is that it's hard to scratch the surface of it without coming to some idea about what philosophy is. Um, and that in itself is a huge area. Um, so we all know, hopefully, that philosophy comes from the Greek philos, love, uh, and sophos, wisdom. Uh, I've got a picture of Pythagoras here somewhere. Yes, because he was reported by Diogenes Laertius to have coined this term, philosophy. Um, but we might not want to define it solely in terms of its etymology. Uh, so when writing this lecture, I was aware that I might uh, need to say something about what, what my understanding of philosophy, philosophy is before commenting on its relation to art and to a lesser extent to beauty. Um, so I opened my trusty copy of the Stanford Encyclopedia uh, in order to remind myself of the lay of the land. Uh, I was unfortunately uh, uh, horrified to find that the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy doesn't contain an entry on philosophy. Um, I suppose they haven't found someone sufficiently expert, or, or perhaps that they think that belongs in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Disciplines. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, so anyway, still determined to avoid undertaking the work myself, I headed home uh, to look at my copy of the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy. Um, and I was again horrified to find out that the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy also doesn't contain an entry on philosophy. Um, the introduction to the Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy does uh, uh, include a, a reference to this omission. Uh, Robert Aldi uh, says, well, he, he thought uh, it, it made sense in a way to leave it out because, uh, in a way, this dictionary as a whole presents a conception of philosophy. Um, but I thought that it would probably uh, 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 be too long, even read quite quickly, to, to, to go through the whole dictionary at the start of this lecture. Um, finally, I turned to the Oxford Companion to Philosophy, uh, and here I did at last find an article uh, on philosophy itself by the eminent British philosopher Anthony Quinton, uh, Baron of Hollywell, who sadly... Uh, uh, sadly died a few years ago. Um, Quinton actually offers a couple of definitions. Uh, he begins by saying the shortest definition and it is quite a good one, is that philosophy is thinking about thinking. Um, so though grateful to have finally alighted on the definition, this seemed no good to me for two reasons. Uh, first, you can think about thinking without doing philosophy, and second, you can do philosophy without thinking about thinking. Uh, <laughs> for example, uh, uh, empirical psychologists frequently think about philosophy uh, uh, without thinking about thinking. Uh, oh, the other way around. Frequently think about thinking without, without doing philosophy, as Graham Locke uh, astutely caught out my deliberate error there to make sure you uh, are listening. Like, likewise, uh, uh, we do it frequently in our everyday life. I, I might, uh, for instance, uh, wonder whether Graham's laughing because he thinks my mistake humorous. Uh, there I'm thinking about what Graham's thinking, but it's not clear that I'm doing philosophy. Um, so, not only can you uh, think about thinking without doing philosophy, you can also, it seems, do philosophy without thinking about thinking. Uh, for example, if I'm trying to work out 
why there's something rather than nothing, or whether there's free will, or what space and time consist in, uh, or what kind of actions are evil, it's not obvious that I need to be thinking about thinking to do that. It's not even obvious that I need to have a conception of thought to do that. You might say if you were a, a, a kind of a metaphysical idealist and you thought all of reality is made up of thought, that I'm still thinking about thinking just in virtue of thinking about reality, but I don't think that can have been what Quinton meant. Um, so luckily he offers another definition, a slightly longer one, uh, in which he says that uh, philosophy is rationally critical thinking of a more or less systematic kind about the general nature of the world the justification of belief, and the conduct of life. That seems somewhat better, at least most of what we actually call philosophy does seem to be rationally critical thinking uh, about this kind of thing, whether those three topics he mentions, uh, 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 the world, the conduct of life, and uh, what was the other, justification of belief, uh, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, whether those are uh, actually uh, exhaustive might be debated. Um, but in any case, I, 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 that seems enough to go forward with, that philosophy is critical thinking about, about the world. We might leave out the other two, since presumably in a broad sense, uh, justification of belief and uh, the right way of acting are, are components of the world. Um, supposing that gives us a, a rough and ready definition of philosophy to be getting on with, uh, it's still not clear it's enough to look at what the philosophical import of the arts and, and beauty are, uh, because we don't know what the purpose of this rational thinking uh, is. I mean, if it's an end in itself, you might say, well, clearly you can engage in that without any, any help from the arts. Um, and Quinton doesn't say anything to elucidate this, actually. Nonetheless, I think it's clearly implicit that the purpose of this rational thinking is something corresponding to the sophos of the etymology of the word philosophy, Perhaps not wisdom, but perhaps something more broad, uh, 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 you know, knowledge uh, or understanding of the world is, is what, what we're aiming that at. Um, so, assuming dogmatically that that's correct, uh, uh, we can then proceed to uh, uh, look at uh, what the relationship is between art and beauty and attempting to understand or know uh, uh, the world or about the world. Um, I thought I might mention, it might seem surprising that I haven't gone through some of the uh, interesting and substantial claims that famous philosophers have made about what philosophy is, uh, such as Plato's claim in Phaedo that uh, philosophy is practice for dying, uh, or Wittgenstein's, uh, the Wittgensteinian view that philosophy is the attempt to dispel the illusion that there are genuine philosophical questions, uh, or, or indeed the view attributed to Jacques Derrida, uh, according to which uh, philosophy is just another literary genre, uh, 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 much like any other. Um, although these are obviously very interesting views, and it might be interesting to look at how art and beauty relate to them, or relate to philosoph philosophy conceived along these lines, uh, uh, they're obviously very controversial, and I assume that most people engaging in philosophy don't take themselves to be engaged in philosophy so conceived. Um, and so that's why it seemed uh, more interesting to start off with a more mundane idea. Um, I'll say something about the uh, historical importance uh, of the question of the relationship between uh, the subject matter of aesthetics and philosophy. Um, so, well, this is a question that can be approached from various angles. Um, one good way is to look at the place uh, uh, of the arts in philosophy historically, and obviously there's a very long history here, a great deal of strife. I think Plato says in the laws that uh, there was an, uh, uh, a hostility between poetry and philosophy even before he was writing when the, uh, 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 the ancient uh, and presumably perhaps uh, uh, Homeric or Homeric inspired poets uh, uh, felt an enmity towards the physical philosophers for ridding the, the world of its gods. Um, quite interestingly, very similar to the kind of uh, objections uh, 19th century romanticists or romantic poets have to the science of their day. Um, however, I'll just go through briefly the uh, 20th century history of uh, uh, philosophy in the English-speaking world, and primarily in the UK. Um, 
so there's various strains of philosophy throughout the last century, but one, the 19th century. Uh, dominant amongst which, at the turn of the last century, is probably British idealism under the influence of Hegel uh, uh, with uh, important thinkers like F.H. Bradley and John McTaggart over at Cambridge. Um, and in the first quarter of the century, you see the beginning of the rise of what's now known as analytical philosophy, the tradition we're here working in today. Um, and this starts with the rejection of idealism, spearheaded by Bertrand Russell and G.E. Moore over at Cambridge. Uh, a similar thing was going on here in Oxford uh, uh, with thinkers such as John Cook Wilson and uh, Harold uh, Pritchard, although they're less famous than their Cambridge counterparts. It's sometimes suggested that that's because they were also engaged in a, a, a distinct philosophical tradition in Oxford of not publishing your work. Um, this was followed in the, in the sort of second quarter of the 20th century by the uh, uh, dominance of logical positivism uh, brought here from Vienna by A.J. Eyre, uh, the movement famous for its uh, uh, claim that statements or sentences which aren't empirically verifi verifiable are meaningless. There's then a period of uh, what's known as Oxford linguistic philosophy, uh, uh, at the front of which is uh, uh, J.L. Austin and also influence of the later Wittgenstein. And then finally you get in the last third of the 20th century roughly what's sometimes known as the naturalistic revolution. Uh, uh, the most important figure in this is probably Willard Van, Van Orman Quine, American philosopher, uh, and I suppose it's at that time when American philosophers start to really dominate in English language philosophy, uh, uh, even here. Um, also J.J.C. Smart, uh, who's Australian, I, I believe. Um, and and th this, this is a movement sort of uh, motivated by the attempt to make uh, the physical sciences, the uh, model upon which philosophy proceeds, and also perhaps the foregone conclusions of all its uh, investigations as well. Um, so there's, there's a clear trend throughout this period. I think in a, at least three of these four sections I crudely cut it up into, uh, a clear trend away from the importance of art uh, and the broader humanities uh, and towards the physical sciences. Um, the, the exception, I, I think, is probably the uh, uh, Oxford uh, ordinary language philosophy. Um, at least it's a bit more of a difficult case. But certainly Russell and Moore, certainly the logical positivists, and certainly the uh, uh, proponents or front runners of the naturalistic revolution uh, are, are all people trying to make physical science central uh, 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 model for philosophy. Um, and there are two ways which you might uh, uh, view this process, depending on uh, what you consider to be of philosophical importance. Uh, on the one hand, you might view it as uh, 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 the glorious march of progress, uh, away from more wishy-washy subjects towards the modern subjects and sciences which uh, developed in the uh, 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 Enlightenment and are, are more trustworthy and effective and so forth than uh, uh, the older humanities and arts, or you might see it as, as worrying to think that it might have a deleterious effect on contemporary philosophy. Um, lots of people have taken either view. Uh, given the dominance of these traditions, it would probably be fair to say that the dominant view is that this has been a uh, salubrious development. Uh, one uh, philosopher who, who's uh, raised concerns about it is uh, the English philosopher and Descartes expert, uh, John Cottingham. Um, so he has an article entitled, entitled What is Humane Philosophy and Why is it at Risk? Uh, in that article, Cottingham goes through, traces the history of uh, English-speaking philosophy in the 20th century, uh, roughly as I have done, and he expresses some worries about this development. Um, in particular, Cottingham's concern is that if philosophy models itself solely on the physical sciences, and he doesn't say this is bad philosophy, only that uh, it shouldn't be all of philosophy. Uh, so if it only does that, uh, uh, he expresses the concern that it's not going to engage the kind of interest which leads us to do philosophy in the first place. 
Um, now, one way of understanding that claim would be to, uh, uh, on the assumption, proceed on the assumption that we do philosophy in order to gain something like sophos, something like uh, knowledge or understanding or wisdom about the world. Now, if philosophy is extremely specialized like the physical sciences, uh, there are advantages there. It means we can have uh, lots of very technical, uh, sophisticated work written down in journals. Uh, and indeed, in science, that's very useful because you can then use uh, 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 these conclusions to build further work, which can have practical implications uh, and so forth, you know, mobile phones, that kind of thing. Uh, however, it's not very easy for any individual to understand very much of it. And so, if you're starting out hoping to answer some urgent questions about reality, and you end up stuck trying to work out how nouns refer, you might feel that, that you're getting nowhere with, with the uh, 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 concerns you started out with. Um, so in particular, Cottingham's worried that uh, the prominence of reductionist scientism, as describes it, uh, 20th century, uh, 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 about in the 20th century, about the philosophy of mind, um, uh, uh, will lead to a kind of a, a explanation of mind which isn't going to speak to us. He says uh, the kind of explanatory clarification we're looking for when we ask what thought is will be at the level of meaningful human activities, not or certainly not exclusively at the level of micro processes. Um, Again, uh, uh, Cottingham worries about this, the, the high level of uh, specialization. Uh, he also suggests that moral philosophy on a scientific mo uh, model becomes abstract, decontextualized, philosophically jejun, and detached from the drama of the human journey. And finally, Cottingham suggests that uh, in adopting an overly scientific style, analytical philosophers neglect the resources of a whole range of linguistic expression. Uh, involving, for example, emotional resonance and symbolic and other figurative elements, which is often right in the foreground for their continental colleagues. These developments I've described didn't happen in what's called continental philosophy, or at least they weren't the main trends. There are other, other trends there. Um, so the idea here seems to be that uh, philosophy becomes impoverished specifically by neglecting the artistic or literary qualities of the language uh, uh, used to express or communicate it. So John Cottingham isn't the only uh, person to express this kind of worry about the uh, uh, physical scientific tendencies of 20th century English language philosophy. Um, in order to assess this idea, it, it, we probably need to ask what exactly is lost, uh, and in particular for our purposes, what exactly is lost from philosophy uh, when it loses touch with the arts uh, and models itself solely on the sciences uh, and indeed ceases to engage with the arts apart from as a specific area of study uh, uh, like the philosophy of stamp collecting or whatever. Um, now, Cottingham uh, suggests in the last quotation I've given that uh, uh, perhaps part of what is lost is that uh, we lose the uh, literary style of language which, which uh, earlier philosophical texts exhibit. Um, however, that's not going to be enough on its own because, well, we obviously might suggest that this is really uh, just ornamentation and as nice as it is, uh, it's really just a distraction uh, from the philosophical work uh, uh, which is a, a matter of describing reality uh, rather than doing so in a, in a uh, fine or beautiful way. Cottingham replies to a criticism of that sort, uh, suggesting that uh, 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 the idea that we can slice off these distracting resonances of emotion and imagination uh, and engage in pure, logically valid argumentation uh, is probably a fantasy. But again, well, okay, perhaps we can't do it, but nonetheless we might still try to do so insofar as we're capable and not worry about the loss when we fail to produce philosophy of a literary nature. Um, so it seems to me we need to look elsewhere for uh, how the arts might contribute to philosophy and why, therefore, a lack of engagement with them, a uh, lack of uh, uh, influence of the arts on philosophy generally might be uh, concerning. So I've got a few 
uh, uh, what, what I think are less persuasive suggestions uh, uh, as to the answer to this question. Um, first, it might be pointed out that works of art, and in particular works of literature, can contain in them literally true uh, statements about the universe of the sort we might be pursuing in philosophy. And indeed, they can even contain uh, philosophical discussions of the kind we find in dialogues, uh, uh, novels like uh, Anna Karenina or Fathers and Sons, 19th century Russian novels frequently uh, uh, exhibit this feature. A second uh, route we might try would be to suggest that uh, art calls into question some of our philosophical presuppositions and therefore leads us to a, a, a better philosophical argument. You might say that reading a novel like uh, uh, Emma uh, questions your presupposition that it's morally acceptable to interfere with other people's relationships, your entertainment, uh, and therefore contributes to your moral philosophizing. Uh, and the third uh, way, unpersuasive way, we might try uh, would be to uh, appeal to the special puzzles created for philosophers by the arts. Um, for example, uh, Arthur Danto says in, in a paper of his entitled The Transfiguration of the Commonplace, that uh, a completely blank canvas, uh, primed for painting, uh, entitled, untitled, uh, uh, presents us with something of much more philosophical interest uh, insofar as it counts as a work of art, whereas something identical doesn't, than we can ever find in the difference between that and a more accomplished uh, painting in, in traditional respects. Uh, he gives the example of Rembrandt's 1655 painting, The Polish Rider. Um, so, I mean, interestingly, if, if Dante is right about that, it might turn out that art has very little philosophical interest or import generally right up until the 20th century when you start getting these challenging avant-garde forms after which it acquires such interest. Um, so although these three points are no doubt correct, uh, works of art can contain philosophical assertions and discussions, uh, they can uh, uh, cause us to question our philosophical presuppositions, uh, and they can indeed present particular, uh, uh, perhaps interesting puzzles for philosophers uh, I don't think any of these could justify the view that uh, uh, the loss of the influence of the arts is any great uh, uh, problem. For one thing, the philosophical statements and discussions can appear in philosophical texts anyway, so we're not losing much there. Likewise, philosophical presuppositions can be challenged uh, in, in uh, philosophical discussion, philosophical texts. We don't need works of art for that. And finally, insofar as artworks raise interesting philosophical puzzles, this is a, a, something we're going to look at simply when we're doing aesthetics, when we're studying uh, the philosophy of art and the philosophy of beauty anyway. So there's no justification there for allowing these things to encroach upon uh, a more scientific and sterile, broader uh, philosophical style. Um, so having dismissed these relatively crude suggestions, I'll make a relatively crude attempt at elucidating what I think might be a better suggestion uh, as to how the arts might contribute to philosophy in a way that isn't dispensable. Um, so, as I've said, 20th century philosophy in the English language, particularly in the UK, exhibits this, this uh, uh, strong tendency towards the sciences. Uh, 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 and to the exclusion of the influence of the arts and broad humanities and so forth. However, this has been resisted uh, uh, by many figures, um, and some of these have commented on what might constitute the philosophical importance of the arts. Uh, there's a recurring idea which appears in the writings of Alfred North Whitehead, Mary Warnock, Roger Scruton, Ronald Hepburn, uh, and others, uh, which associates the arts in this context, and in particular poetry, with uh, capturing or communicating experience. It's obviously an idea we've come across before uh, in Tolstoy, Croce, and Collingwood's uh, uh, theories of art. Um, so an obvious way to sketch a philosophical account of the importance of the arts uh, would be to appeal to uh, this classic distinction made in analytical philosophy and elsewhere between knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. 
the locus classicus for that in uh, uh, analy analytical philosophy is a 1910 paper by Bertrand Russell. Um, an example of knowledge by acquaintance would be uh, my knowledge or familiarity with the city of Oxford. I, I'm acquainted with Oxford, I know it. An example of knowledge by description uh, would be my knowledge that Oxford is in the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, the object of knowledge by description isn't a, a thing or an object or a city like Oxford. It's rather something like a proposition or a fact, the fact that Oxford is in the UK. Uh, likewise, you can have knowledge by acquaintance of a sort of people, right? Uh, you can know Samuel Hughes. You can't know that Samuel Hughes. Uh, to be knowledge by description. Uh, there's a particularly interesting uh, example of knowledge by acquaintance uh, which comes up in a, a philosophical area we're not looking at specifically philosophy of mind, uh, and that's your knowledge of your own perceptual experiences uh, or qualia, uh, as they're sometimes called, or sense data earlier on before uh, that term fell out of fashion um, as a result of theory associated with it. Um, and there's actually a famous argument uh, uh, which uh, uh, tries to appeal to these to undermine a, a physicalist theory of, of uh, the world, a physicalist metaphysical theory, according to which everything is physical. Uh, this is known as the Mary argument, and it describes a, a, a brilliant scientist called Mary who is uh, trapped or, or secured somehow in a room where everything is black and white, uh, and she's uh, forced to uh, research the physiognomy of vision. Uh, and so she comes to learn everything there is to learn, because she's a brilliant scientist, everything there is to learn, uh, physically at least, about uh, vision and about colour perception. Now it's pointed out that when Mary goes outside uh, and sees the, uh, the uh, ripe tomatoes and the clear sky and so forth, she'll come to know something about colour or colour experience which she didn't know before. Uh, and it's sometimes suggested that this shows that uh, there's something more than the physical to this stuff. Uh, there are also many, many replies to this and ongoing uh, uh, debates over it. Um, in any case, the position uh, suggested by those philosoph philosophers I, I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, that the arts are capable uh, of conveying or communicating knowledge by experience, uh, but knowledge by acquaintance, or something of that sort, would give us an obvious answer to the question concerning why uh, uh, getting rid of the arts from philosophy, or treating them as if they were merely another area for philosophical inquiry of a purely descriptive kind, uh, might be deleterious. And the answer would be, well, when we're doing philosophy, we want uh, knowledge or understanding of the world. Some knowledge or understanding of the world is by description, but some is by acquaintance. And so if we ignore all of the acquaintance, then we're going to be giving ourselves in an impoverished understanding of things. Um, I have an example. Here's a poem by Wordsworth, very famous poem. A slumber did my spirit seal, I had no human fears. She seemed a thing that could not feel the touch of earthly years. No motion has she now, no force. She neither hears nor sees, rolled round in earth's diurnal course with rocks and stones and leaves. It's actually trees on the end there, sorry. Similar, either way. Heresy of paraphrase. Uh, so anyway, this poem uh, carries with it uh, a sense of the mysteriousness of the world or our place in reality, uh, something along those lines, or at least many people feel it carries with it something like that. Uh, if it's right that you can't convey that by describing it, I mean, obviously you can describe it, but you can't give someone the same thing by describing it as you give them if they're experiencing it, just like Mary doesn't uh, know the same thing when she learns the physics of vision as when she experiences colour. If that's true, then there's a role for the arts in our understanding of the world which can't be served by purely descriptive philosophy. Um, now, uh, even if that is the case, it might not justify John Cottingham's suggestion that we ought to uh, include literary elements in our philosophical language. Uh, you might still say, well, these are uh, uh, disciplines or areas worth keeping separate. You can have philosophy which uh, doesn't merely ignore 
the import or influence of the arts, but nonetheless doesn't try to engage in artistic expression whilst engaging in philosophy at the same time. Um, so that's one respect in which we might want to refine this idea. Another respect in which we might want to do so uh, is by uh, reconsidering the notion of acquaintance. Uh, it's often pointed out that if the point of art is to provide us with some kind of knowledge, then it seems very odd that we return again and again to the same work of art once we've acquired the knowledge that it provides. Um, so uh, this is a point made by Roger Scruton in his uh, work on music and, and others elsewhere. Uh, so you might think that something like apprehension would be a better term. The point is we return to Wordsworth, per, Wordsworth's poem not merely because uh, 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 we want to regain our acquaintance, which would seem to be logically questionable, but because we want to apprehend once again whatever it is we experience uh, uh, when reading it. Um, however, I'll, I'll keep talking about knowledge by acquaintance since it's a more common uh, turn of phrase. Um, so, I'll, I'll move on, I think, to uh, uh, some further points. I mean, in order to flesh out this idea that uh, the arts can convey knowledge by acquaintance and therefore they have a a role to play in our overall understanding of the world, perhaps as part of our philosophical understanding or perhaps as a rival to it. Uh, uh, you might think that philosophy can remain descriptive, but then there's just this whole other way of understanding things uh, 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 which we need to take notice of as well. I mean, they might not be rivals, they might be separate, but uh, uh, work well together, I suppose. There's lots of permutations you could try. Uh, this idea, anyway, it would probably need to be fleshed out by looking at where precisely this knowledge by acquaintance becomes important. Um, you might think that some kinds of knowledge by acquaintance don't seem to have much significance for our understanding of the world. Uh, knowing what gin and tonic tastes like, for instance, is probably not very important. Knowing the city slough probably isn't very important uh, to our overall understanding of the world. Um, Maybe someone might argue that it's never important that uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, knowledge by acquaintance or uh, uh, apprehension of things is, is really irrelevant uh, and that our overall understanding of the world should be wholly theoretical. I think that claim could be quite easily dispelled, um, perhaps by adopting an argument which I think John Foster uh, uh, once made, um, uh, uh, according to which, uh, well, uh, even our theoretical descriptions of the world, those that appear in uh, science, those appear, that appear in uh, 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 the most technical of physics, still presuppose some kind of knowledge by acquaintance. Uh, all the language is either talking about things which we've come to understand uh, through apprehension of them, or uh, employs metaphors which we can understand because we've apprehended other things. Um, that seems like quite a compelling uh, uh, argument. Um, even having done that and fleshed out this idea and looked at where, where knowledge by acquaintance is important, I mean perhaps in the ethical understanding of the world it's more important than in metaphysics and, and, and so forth, uh, 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 we shouldn't have completely uh, covered the area. Uh, and so I want to say something about uh, uh, two final topics relating uh, uh, this to uh, mysticism uh, and therefore more broadly to the philosophy of religion uh, and also to the notion of wonder uh, in philosophy. Um, so it's probably a familiar idea to some of you or, or perhaps to all of you that wonder or, or in Greek taumatstein uh, has been thought by many philosophers since Plato and Aristotle uh, to play some kind of special or important role in philosophy. Um, and there are various ways in which you might look at this. Uh, from a contemporary kind of physical science oriented uh, uh, view, you might say, well, what we mean by wonder is really something just like curiosity. Uh, so it's rather a good thing for our investigation of the world because it leads us to ask questions and try to find answers. Uh, but it's not anything of particular importance because it's, it's dispelled as soon as we 
uh, uh, succeed in finding out the things we want to find out. Um, there's a very illuminating article by Ronald Hepburn entitled Wonder, which he delivered uh, as an inaugural uh, uh, address to the Aristotelian Society. And in that article, Hepburn distinguishes wonder from mere curiosity uh, and points to cases where wonder, unlike curiosity, remains even once all the answers are in, or at least all the answers we're able to acquire. Um, his favourite... I've got two pictures in the wrong way around, I've realised. There you go, that's uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> ecstasy of St Francis. Uh, uh, Ronald Hepburn's uh, uh, favourite example of the kind of thing which uh, elicits wonder even when there are still... Uh, uh, even when there are no questions further to be asked is the existence of the universe itself. Uh, uh, this, he says, couldn't possibly uh, uh, have an explanation because it includes everything. Uh, if that's right, uh, 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 then it's something which nonetheless uh, elicits wonder. He's speaking outside of a theological context then. There, uh, you might say, well, the universe itself exists because of God. And argue this point, of course, the retort would be, no, God is one of the things I'm including in everything. That's what I find wonderful. Uh, and so forth. Uh, incidentally, uh, uh, Robert Nozick, when discussing this question of the existence of absolutely everything, goes through various different kinds of answers you might give. Uh, uh, but one of which does appeal to the arts, he says, uh, uh, maybe all you can do is gesture to a Rothko painting. So that's a, oh, it comes out quite well. That's a Rothko painting, uh, uh, which might uh, be a case of the arts helping us understand that question. Some people associate Rothko with the inexpressible. I suppose that's what he's getting at there. Uh, in any case, I'll finally just say a few things about mysticism. Uh, so Hepburn... Uh, uh, his understanding of wonder and its place in philosophy, it's actually quite a sober understanding because uh, he doesn't think that it signifies anything uh, uh, beyond uh, the reality of which we're normally aware. Um, but he nonetheless associates it closely with a uh, uh, religiously toned uh, experience and indeed with a uh, uh, mystical experience. Um, and this is definitely, well, mystical experience is definitely something which has been confined very much to the margins uh, of philosophical discussion uh, 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 by the uh, 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 rise to preeminence of the physical sciences in, in uh, 20th century philosophy. However, in the history of philosophy, uh, mystical experience plays quite a central role. It's very important uh, in Plato and even more so in Neoplatonism. It also features in the background uh, uh, of philosophers like uh, even Descartes, Kant, Hegel, uh, and so forth. Um, so you might think that our, our getting rid of uh, discussion of our, our mystical experience and a more down-to-earth uh, approach to things is salubrious. Nonetheless, it's interesting as a topic of investigation. Um, so the classical work on, on religious experience generally uh, uh, in recent philosophy is uh, William James's uh, Gifford Lectures, entitled Varieties of uh, Religious Experience, and published in 1902. Um, that's a very fascinating book, generally. Uh, James makes uh, mystical experience central to religious experience. He categorizes, or characterizes, rather, mystical experiences as those with, a, well, combining a noetic quality, a sense of a epistemic illumination or revelation, uh, a quality of ineffability, but also passivity, there's something that happens to people rather than being brought on by them, and transience, they don't tend to last long, not more than a few hours, he estimates is the longest. Um, so James provides reports of such experience uh, in very great number, uh, sufficient to make it clear, even some quite sceptical, that there's some kind of uh, phenomenon here uh, to be described, um, although, of course, as James notes, a hard-nosed naturalist uh, would want to account for this phenomenon as merely some kind of psychological uh, occurrence. Um, and these uh, reports include primarily very articulate but uh, uh, unknown or unnotable persons uh, primarily, but they also include, later on in the book, uh, uh, people like Pseudo Dionysius and Saint Ignatius, St. Teresa, the Muslim theologian uh, Al-Ghazali, and uh, also yogic and Buddhist sources as well. 
And it's very interesting, James emphasizes the uh, similarity across uh, these different traditions in the reports of such experiences. He actually says, uh, in Hinduism, in Neoplatonism, in Sufism, in Christian mysticism, in Whitmanism, there is <laughs> about mystical utterances and eternal unanimity which ought to make a critic stop and think. Um, there's a similarity in these experiences. They're characterized roughly as uh, 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 having similar uh, facets, things like time transcendence, uh, 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 oneness with the, the divine, um, etc., the unity of everything. Um, so there are, it might be that such experiences aren't of great philosophical importance at all. Uh, they certainly seem to have had a lot of influence on philosophy historically. If they do have a great deal of philosophical importance, uh, and James ends up con concluding that they are epistemically authoritative for those who have them, and undermine normal rationalistic uh, uh, or empirical uh, epistemic authority in such cases, uh, if that's right, and if they're connected importantly to the arts or to the aesthetic, then that would be another respect in which the arts and the aesthetic are very philosophically important. Um, so there's an idea here of connection between philosophy, a certain kind of philosophy, and mysticism and the arts, which appears in a lot of thinkers in quite an inchoate way. Uh, that's one way of, of attempting to clarify it. Um, so one thing we might note about the relationship between mystical experiences of the sort James is uh, discussing and the aesthetic is that they're often associated with or brought on by what look like it's aesthetic experiences, in particular aesthetic experiences of nature. Moreover, James repeatedly draws a comparison between the knowledge felt to be conveyed by these experiences, though knowledge of an ineffable variety, uh, by those who have them, and knowledge by sensation, in his terms, as opposed to conceptual thought, uh, and he suggests that, uh, well, and this looks very like uh, uh, the Russellian distinction I was talking about earlier between acquaintance and description. Uh, so you might think that this is again, if there's knowledge to be had here, it's of a kind that could only be uh, expressed or communicated artistically as opposed to merely descriptively. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, well, James says something of the sort uh, himself. Uh, he says, uh, in mystical literature, such self-contradictory phrases as dazzling obscurity, whispering silence, teeming desert, are continually met with. They prove that not conceptual speech, but music, rather, is the element through which we are best spoken to by mystical truth. And he goes on to say that uh, music gives us ontological messages with non which non-musical criticism is unable to contradict though it may laugh at our foolishness in minding them. Um, so James is very sympathetic to the idea that this is uh, uh, something of philosophical importance. He does say, uh, uh, by way of sobriety, that mystical experiences of uh, uh, some people don't have epistemic authority for other people who haven't had them. It's still perfectly reasonable to treat someone else who purports to have a mystical experience with scepticism. Uh, Nonetheless, he, he suggests that uh, 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 they uh, confirm that our kind of consciousness is only one kind of consciousness amongst many and is only divided from other kinds by the thinnest of barriers uh, uh, and therefore, as I've said, that our normal rationalistic and empirical approaches to understanding the world uh, 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 are not deserving of the uh, 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 dominance which they're sometimes... Uh, I felt to deserve. Okay, that's all I have to say about that. And generally, I've spoken about exams, so I don't really need to go through that. 11 to 12 on Tuesday and Wednesday, and I will be here in the hall in, in the JCR. So, any time then is fine.
Mr. Ralph, can you verify anything you just said? That's what I want to know. Well, I can't verify the uh, authority of other people's uh, experiences, but uh, any that you've undergone yet, you should go Yes, yes, yes. 